I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce the speaker for the Preservation Trust's first ever online talk. Bruce Cluett is likely already known to many of you uh, for as a historical consultant. He's been helping us understand the history of Connecticut for over 40 years and helping us appreciate its historic places. Bruce holds a PhD from the University of Connecticut and wrote his dissertation on Hartford's immigrant population. He has brought his historical expertise and his passion for the people and places of historic Connecticut out of the academy to make a real difference on the ground. Bruce has undertaken work throughout the state that has produced many national and state register nominations and national historic landmark studies. He has investigated and documented historic structures for the Historic American Building Survey, and he has advised developers and architects in planning the restoration of historic buildings. As a communicator, Bruce has written numerous books and articles, helped create exhibitions, and designed and written text for websites. He has presented at conferences, teaches, and gives talks, and leads tours. His contribution has been profound, and early this year, he received the Janet Jan Shig Award from Preservation Connecticut, recognition of the professional excellence he has repeatedly demonstrated as a preservationist. At the Trust, we have repeatedly benefited from his expertise. Bruce brought his championing of industrial history to our publication, Carriages and Clocks, Corsets and Locks, and he has led many tours for us. Maybe you were on the tour of Fairhaven he led for us as a part of the Festival and Arts and Ideas Tour last year. I'm delighted that Bruce agreed to talk again to a Trust audience today and that he proposed a subject so important to both the history of New Haven and to preservationists, New Haven's stations past and present. So please join me in welcoming onto your screen our speaker today, Bruce Cluett. Very good. New Haven Railroad Stations, past and present. Uh, I guess it's really obvious, but in order to have a railroad station, a city has to have a railroad. And that railroad came very early to New Haven. Uh, 1832, New Haven business interests with James Brewster, the carriage manufacturer taking the lead, uh, getting a charter from the Connecticut legislature, getting a Yale professor to lay out a route and building what is the first significant railroad in Connecticut. Now I have to say people in the eastern part of the state will point out that the Stonington Railroad actually opened a little bit before the Hartford and New Haven Railroad, but that was a, just a seven mile route in the far eastern part of the state. This was the first true uh, long distance railroad in Connecticut. Uh, they had some ups and downs as you know, throughout American history, depressions hit with some uh, frequency. But uh, by 1839, the railroad was completed to Hartford. It seems obvious also to us that railroads need railroad stations, but it wasn't necessarily obvious to them because railroads were Bruce, so new. Chris, we're not seeing your PowerPoint, is that correct? Oh, I have it up. I'm seeing it. You're not seeing anything. Um, are you sharing your screen? I am indeed. Let me try again, all right? Maybe you could retry, yes. Yes. How's that? Now you're there seeing you. it. Thank you. Many, many apologies again. I have to uh, ask your indulgence here as I, uh, as I try to go through this. Um, Hartford and New Haven Railroad was a first major railroad in Connecticut and brought the railroad, a functioning railroad to uh, New Haven in 1838 and actually got to Hartford in the, the following year. Um, the first railroad station or what we would call a railroad station was down on Steamboat Wharf uh, 
and the rail line ran then as it does now paralleling East Street down to where the New Haven terminal has its uh, oil facility. And on this early map of New Haven, you can see it's labeled Railroad Depot. And uh, in a later view, you get an idea of what it may have looked like. It's a very utilitarian building. It basically was a place for trains to drive inside, people to get out uh, and transfer to the steamboat to New York. So in a sense, it was almost less of a railroad station than an adjunct to the very important steamboat business. Um, transportation improvements were seen as the key to a city's prosperity. New Haven merchants, Hartford merchants, manufacturers wanted to get on the map of transportation improvements. A few years earlier, they had done the canal thing, but now they realized this was an age of railroads, even though they weren't quite sure what railroads were going to become. So it was kind of a prosaic utilitarian place on the dock that was the first railroad station. Interestingly enough, uh, when the railroad was being built, they had a dispute with the New Haven Steamboat Company, which had been bought by the Connecticut River Steamboat Company. And of course, the Connecticut River people didn't want a competing uh, way to New York City uh, through this uh, New Haven connection. So they put up all sorts of obstacles and the railroad company simply started its own steamboat line. They bought three used steamboats and built this station on the dock next to the Tomlinson Bridge and uh, went into business for themselves. Um, you know, it's kind of surprising, if I could back up for just a minute, it's kind of surprising with our concept of what a railroad station should be, that this is so far afield. Uh, here, is the New Haven Green. Here is the Connecticut State Capitol. Remember at this time, both Hartford and New Haven were co-capitals of Connecticut. Uh, here's the big commercial area around Ninth Square. And so Steamboat Wharf is really remote from everything that's going on. Uh, here's Yale University, Yale College. It's a long walk, you couldn't walk it. You'd have to take uh, some sort of cab or something a horse-drawn cab to get there. But what that reflected is the whole purpose of the railroad was to get to the steamboat connection to New York. In 1839, when it opened to Hartford, that was it. It didn't go anywhere else. There were no other railroads from New Haven to anywhere else. The only way that you could continue your journey was to get on the steamboat to New York. And I would say that uh, um, certainly if you look at the advertisements, they basically were advertising the railroad as an adjunct to the steamboat. Steamboats were a fairly mature technology by this point. They had been operation 15, 20 years. Railroads were brand new and primitive by comparison. So the first New Haven station was a steamboat station. And it, stayed uh, in operation uh, as the major New Haven station for a little more than 10 years. But by 1849, it was clear that New Haven needed more. Why? Well, for one thing, New Haven had actual rail connections by that point. In 1844, the railroad was completed from Hartford to Springfield. So now you could get on a train in New Haven and get to Boston via Springfield and Worcester. That was huge. Uh, it, you could also get uh, up the, the so-called canal line from New Haven to Plainville to Simsbury and on to Northampton, Massachusetts. Finally, and most importantly, by 1848, you could get on a train in New Haven and get to New York City. That was the New York and New Haven Railroad. It wasn't an all-rail route. You still had to take a 
what was called a railroad car ferry across the big rivers, but it was a mostly rail route into New York. And so this was a station that served three separate railroads and um, was beyond uh, anything that had existed at Steamboat Dock. Now I'll give you a minute to look at this illustration of the Chapel Street Station and just ask you, where are the tracks? It's a railroad station with no tracks. Uh, here's where it was, by the way. You can see how close to the green, what an improvement it is in terms of location over the Steamboat War. But uh, when you look at that, where are the tracks? The answer is the tracks are underground. This portion of the railroad ran in the old Farmington Canal bed and the Chapel Street Station was built over the tracks. This was convenient, but in some ways a disadvantage. The lighting and ventilation of the 1840s was not up to having steam trains chugging through the lower level constantly. And uh, people complained bitterly about the dirt and smoke and uh, lack of baggage facilities and the darkness. Pardon me while I read you a quote here. The track under the station is badly, this was published in the local newspaper. The track under the station is badly lighted and some not, sometimes not lighted at all. Then it goes on to say the pickpockets are having a field day. The station is frequently smoke filled and baggage is strewn all over the air, area. So it's an early station. It has some very nice features, but it also had some um, things that were not quite working out. It was, however, convenient and close to everything. It was close to the green. It was close to a lot of the churches. It was uh, close to where the, uh, court, uh, the uh, state house was. It was close to new residential areas like Worcester Square. So from that point of view, one problem solved, but other problems remained. This station was designed by Henry Austin, the so-called father of New Haven architects. Austin had worked with Ithiel Town and A.J. Davis. And when he moved to New Haven in 1841, he advertised that he was able to design buildings in every variety of architectural style. Over the next few years, he went on to prove it. The Italian houses in Worcester Square, the Gothic library building that he designed for Yale College, now Dwight Hall. He even went to Egypt for inspiration when he designed the monumental gates for Grove Street Cemetery. So Austin was definitely a person who could design in every style, which makes us ask, what style was his Chapel Street Station? It has been, been called Italianate, it's been called Dravidian, whatever that means, it's been called Pagoda style. Um, but it was unique. More important than its architectural eclecticism, I think, is its monumentality. 300 feet long, the main tower is 140 feet high. This was a station not only to stop, wait for trains, etc. This was a statement about the prosperity of the railroads and the prosperity of New Haven. It became an instant landmark. It became a destination in its own right. You could get to the top of that tower and actually look out. Again, pardon me while I get to a quotation. Uh, it was called an extraordinary addition to the architectural embellishment of the city. Talking about that tower, the spectator looks down on a forest of luxuriant elms, maples, intermingled with which are the stately mansions, beautiful cottages, towering spires, and tasteful gardens of our sylvan city. 
So it was a destination in and of itself, and it was a great testament uh, to New Haven. Um, which begs the question, where the, was the smoky darkness of this station, the uh, close clearances, the pickpockets, was that sort of worth the monumentality? And I will say that um, the ability of this station to be expanded was its downfall. Uh, think back on that picture I showed you of the locomotive under the station. Initially, there was one track going through. They managed to get a second track in, which called the, uh, caused the poet um, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. to say that uh, you had to stand murderously close to the walls to, be, to avoid being struck by the trains. Um, that made it less functional as a station when they double tracked it, and yet they needed to, to get capacity. Finally, uh, in 1866, the state ordered the railroads involved to clean up, uh, to remedy all the problems that the public had identified. The result was a new station for New Haven called the Union Station because in addition to the three railroads involved in Chapel Street, there now was a railroad that went to Derby. There was another railroad that went to Middletown and Willimantic. There was a railroad that went along the shoreline uh, to New London. So New Haven had actually six different railroads, uh, two of which the New York and New Haven and the Hartford and New Haven merged to form the New York, New Haven and Hartford Railroad, which came to dominate transportation all throughout Southern uh, New England, really. But it too was monumental. It was stylish, French, French Second Empire. It was, uh, if you count the length of the platform, it was 400 feet long. It was a side platform so that there were four covered tracks and numerous other uncovered tracks, and it was expandable. So much more functional in a way than, than Chapel Street. The downside of the new Union Station, the 1875 Union Station, was its location. It was half a mile from the old station, so maybe three quarters of a mile from Yale and from uh, the other places in downtown New Haven where you wanted to be. It was a location that suited the railroad, but not necessarily the traveling public, but there was plenty of uh, place to expand. Here's the 1879 bird's eye view. And you can see the extent of railroad facilities around this 1875 station. That's all on land that was created by Phil, by filling in New Haven Harbor that the railroad undertook. And then they built their repair shops, freight facilities, everything. And of course the passenger station on that made land. Um, I'll give you a moment to find the old station in relative to the new station. Can you see it? Can you find it? I'll give you a little hint. There, there it is. There's the old station. Here it is uh, blown up a little bit. So you can see that it was still there. This to me is very interesting because this is adaptive reuse. First instance of adaptive reuse that I know of. The old Chapel Street Station became the New Haven City Market. This was a kind of mini um, Quincy Market, as it were, that uh, occupied the old station. Again, Henry Austin adapted it. They tore out the men's and separate waiting rooms for men and women, opened up the interior, then redivided it into, the, into stalls. There's a couple of... Uh, advertisements, but all totaled, uh, there were more than two dozen businesses in this station. There were, um, there was a restaurant, there were multiple fish markets, multiple meat markets, coffee, tea, and spice shops, uh, more than two dozen. And this endured through the 1890s. Finally, the city market burned in, um, 1892, when one of the vendors selling fireworks on the sidewalk let things get out of hand. So memo to all you real estate developers out there, do not rent space to fireworks companies. 
uh, one of the towers uh, uh, soldiered on for another 10 years and then it was all gone. But uh, it show, it, you know, it's interesting that something that was so vital to the center of New Haven could take on a completely different use and really get another uh, at least 15, almost 20 years of, uh, of viability. So the new Union Station was remote. By that time, the horse car system in New Haven had developed so that you could walk out the door and get a horse car to the college, to other places throughout New Haven. This was the Fair Haven and West, uh, Westville uh, Horse Railroad. So that kind of made up for not being there. It was a very nice station. Uh, they added on to it in 1897 so that they had uh, package express capabilities. Uh, and it served New Haven pretty well. Um, however, fire began to take a toll. The first part to go was that center section where there was the clock tower and the big mansard roof. It just burned away uh, in the early 1890s. And when that happened, it no longer had the same imposing sense to it. Moreover, it was kind of getting old fashioned. And I think that as the 20th century dawned, people in New Haven were inspired to want something more, certainly uh, something more than a half burned out edifice. Finally, in uh, 1918, what was left of it burned to the ground. Uh, tragic, uh, but by that point, plans were already afoot for yet another Union Station. And that's the Union Station that we know today. Here it is in the 1950 postcard. It was located right adjacent to the site of the 1875 Union Station. In fact, the 1875 station was on the site of the present parking garage. So they were, as my French Canadian relatives were wont to say, side by each. This station was designed by one of America's first star architects, star architects. And that person was Cass, Cass Gilbert. Uh, Gilbert was already extremely well known by this point. Um, he had cooperated with Frederick Law Olmsted, that's junior Frederick Law Olmsted, on New Haven's first city plan. His idea of a city plan was a very controlled environment with monumental avenues, monumental buildings, and overall a real sense of the city beautiful. He contributed one of the first elements to realizing that in 1911, when he designed a new public library on the green for New Haven. And then working in New York City, he designed the Woolworth building, opened in 1913. Now I forget how many stories it was, but it was the tallest building in the world until the Empire State Building was completed. So Gilbert had some chops and was in a very good position to come up with a new impressive station for New Haven. Unfortunately for him, perhaps, uh, his ambitions exceeded those that the railroad was able to afford. This is his 1913 design for the new station. And you can see it's got everything. It's like a Beaux-Arts competition design. It's got cartouches, it's got rustication, it's got engaged column, it's got arches, it's got the name of the railroad uh, along the frieze here. I think it's got a clock. I think that's a clock, but I'm not 100% sure. But it is truly grand. Unfortunately, the railroad had entered upon a series of acquisitions. In order to monopolize transportation, it bought up all the other railroads it could. It bought up all the street rail railroads, the trolley companies, and went into a tremendous amount of debt. And now it's got to pay for the new station. So the railroad went back to Gilbert and asked for something a little less ostentatious 
this is his second design. The engaged columns are now pilasters, the parapet, the uh, 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 fancy uh, parapet is now a plain parapet. The name of the railroad is in much smaller letters. Still got a clock, it's still pretty nice, but even that proved to be impossible for the railroad to fund. So the final station is what we see there today. Substantially plainer and yet still very nice. And Gilbert is known to have said, no matter how ornate or how simple, in the last analysis, its principal claim to beauty lies in its proportions. And I think we can all agree the proportions of the present Union Station are still very, um, still very pleasing. Uh, the interior is lovely. And this is the railroad station that served New Haven through the 1920s, through the Depression, and through World War II. Uh, times change, and in the 50s and 60s, uh, railroads everywhere were in decline. In 1968, the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad was merged into the Penn Central, along with the New York Central and the Penn Central, and the uh, Pennsylvania Railroad. Now, I'm not sure why combining three bankrupt railroads into one entity would seem to suggest that that entity was going to be profitable. Penn Central was not, and it continued to uh, disinvest. The station was finally closed in 1972, and the only way to get to a train was to get down through the passageway. They kept the passageway to the tracks open, but the station itself was closed up and pretty, uh, pretty much deteriorated. Um, oh, I'm sorry, this is a little out of sequence. Uh, I meant to point out that like its predecessor, the present station was served well by public transportation. So in the 20s and 30s and early 40s, uh, you had first trolley cars and then buses that allowed you to get anywhere in New Haven. Here's a picture of the grand waiting room in 1975. And you can see that part of the, the mezzanine level has been boarded up. Um, it just shows signs of neglect. A lot of the very distinctive benches have either been removed or incorporated into that uh, center structure. By the way, these benches are very interesting because um, unlike the old station, which just had a lot of stoves heating it, this was centrally heated and the steam heat actually was brought up through the benches. So at the top was kind of a register where warm air exited. So how cozy was that? What a great idea. Uh, they pioneered it here and used it in a lot of their other stations. But by the 1970s, uh, certainly by the 1980s, this was in pretty sad shape. Uh, it was threatened with demolition. New Haven preservationists rallied, tried to save the station. Fortunately, federal money was available at that time as part of the Amtrak improvements. And as we all know, the uh, wonderful New Haven station, the main waiting room, was restored to a lot of its original glory. The beautiful ceiling, the marble walls, the uh, marble floors. And although they're not functional heaters, uh, some of those heated benches are still in place. And it's working very well. Uh, in this, you can see an interesting part of the uh, station that some of you may remember. This is going to take a minute for me to get up here. Hang on. No, I lost it. I was going to show the uh, the Solari screen, which was a wonderful part of the restored station. Those of you who are um, not uh, recent arrivals to New Haven will remember the station's uh, arrivals and departure board. It was a wonderful mixture of light and sound and action. Uh, the flip screen uh, was only taken down a few years ago but really a great preservation success story.
I want to finish up by talking about the State Street Station. This uh, station um, was also secondary to another transportation improvement in that it was built as part of the mitigation for reconstructing I-95 over the Mill River. The Kew Bridge, the Pearl Harbor Bridge, a decades long project and part of the mitigation for the inevitable traffic impacts of that project was to create an eastbound rail system from New Haven. And Shoreline East was created to run to Old Saybrook through all the suburb, eastern suburban towns of New Haven. And some of the trains actually ran through to New London. Uh, the station, uh, as you can see here, very close to the 1849 Chapel Street station. So it was once again, a downtown facility uh, designed by uh, Michael Baker Architects. It was, however, a very limited facility, virtually no amenities other than signage, no restrooms, no heat, uh, not much room to really wait other than on the platforms itself. A minimal structure, but still a structure that allowed you to get on a train in New London, come to New Haven, uh, get off and be really close to everything that was downtown. Not all Metro North trains went to State Street, but several did. So it was kind of a, a halfway measure in the other direction. You could get on in Grand Central and get to State Street, but not on all the trains. Then uh, planning began for a line, uh, renewed, uh, increased uh, passenger service between New Haven and Hartford. And for this purpose, an additional platform was built at State Street and the entire State Street facade was rebuilt. So um, this is the current State Street station. Again, no bathrooms, no heat, no actual connection with the older part of the station. You have to go out, walk under this big overhang and then walk across the overpass that you see up there, which is quite confusing because some trains stop on one side, some stop on the other. And yet nevertheless, um, it is a pretty good downtown uh, station. So with State Street, New Haven finally had everything. It had a grand functional high capacity station at the 1920 Union Station, somewhat remote from the downtown. It had a station close to downtown in that State Street uh, does fulfill that function. And also both of these are closely tied in with public transit in New Haven. So it has the potential at least to really function as a complete transportation system. I'm gonna go look at some of the questions and comments now, but before I do, I just wanted to thank two entities, the New Haven Museum, a wonderful archival source for all kinds of historical photographs, and also Bob Boletsky, whose Tyler City Station website has great historical information, not only about New Haven stations, but also about all the stations in New Haven, New, in uh, Connecticut. So now I'm going to chat, all right? Uh-oh, I don't see any comments. All I see is people saying they can't see the PowerPoint. I hope that was rectified. Oh, I have a question here. Why did Union Station add the underground tunnel for tracks? It always leaked rather than doing it through a bridge. Um, I think it didn't leak when it, was, uh, when it was built. I think it probably had a lot of uh, integrity when it was first opened. I think the problem was um, disinvestment, lack of repair. Uh, the answer, I think, is uh, that uh, underground uh, 
uh, worked out easier um, uh, in terms of construction. Uh, it also provided, again, if it wasn't leaking, provided a weather tight way for pedestrians to get from the grand uh, waiting room to their covered platform. And eventually they had seven, eight or nine covered platforms without being exposed to the weather. So I think that would be the answer there. Um, are there any graphics at Straight State Street uh, depicting the earlier station near the site? Thank you very much, Kevin McCarthy, for mentioning that. There is actually an interpretive panel by yours truly that recounts the earlier history of stations at the site that the Department of Transportation uh, paid for, uh, partly at the urging of the Connecticut State Historic Preservation uh, Office. Um, I believe that the 1920 station did uh, construct the first tunnels, at least for the first uh, four tracks. How does the timeline of station development in New Haven mimic development around New England? Um, that's a good question because I think it follows what a lot of cities went through. If you look at Cincinnati, if you look at Buffalo, their earlier stations, which were downtown, became very congested in terms of railroad operations. They needed more tracks. They went to a off, um, I, they went to a location outside the center city. In Buffalo, about three miles outside the center of the city. In Cincinnati, not quite so far, but if you know where the Cincinnati museums uh, are now. Uh, so um, that was a trend. Uh, a couple of cities, had two stations that still had some pretty good downtown access, both North Station and South Station in Boston, which kind of split the burden of rail transport are uh, pretty conveniently located. Pennsylvania Station and Grand Central in New York, again, splitting the burden of, of rail transportation are uh, pretty close to uh, many things in New York. However, in those cases, you kind of have what you have between Union Station and State Street now. You don't have a complete link between your two railroad stations. So there are many solutions to the dilemma of meeting the needs of the railroad for space, for multiple tracks, for connections, operations, and meeting the needs of the traveling public in terms of amenities, and getting everything close to everything else downtown. It's a dilemma that maybe we never can be satisfactorily solved. I think with State Street and Union Station and assuming a really good public transit network, I think New Haven might get pretty close to that. There is a question about the restaurant in Union Station. What other retail was ever part of that building? thinking about possibilities for development today. I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know what retail was in the 1920 station prior to the redevelopment of the station in the 1980s. Uh, that would be a really good thing to know. I know that the, the 1875 Union Station had a big restaurant that's said to have used 150 pounds of roast beef a day uh, and uh, gallons upon gallons of oysters a day, uh, 50 to 75 chickens a day. So that was a pretty, sub that was pretty substantial retail. Now the Chapel Street Station had a library in it, a reading room. And uh, as far as I know, that was not repeated in any subsequent station. So the amenities are boundless, use your imagination. Ah, let's see now. Oh, uh, um, uh, Douglas Hausladen says, I can answer questions on the leaking uh, passageway. There was a track project that caused water leaks. And at that time, the engineers clogged the drains reopen the drains and water is directed appropriately to the right drains. Well, that's good to know. <laughs>
Other questions? Any other questions at this point? Oh, are there any images of the interiors of the 1849 or 1875 station? I do not know of any. Um, and uh, that would be wonderful to see. There's pretty good descriptions. I mean, the, the 1849, there's good descriptions of the gentleman's parlor. It's called uh, in la a separate ladies parlor, described as sumptuously furnished. Um, but as far as I know, there isn't uh, real good graphic evidence. Okay. I think you have another question about the tunnel. You have another question about the tunnel? Oh, um, I believe it was part of the 1920 building, at least for some of the tracks. And I believe that it had to be extended as they went from four covered tracks uh, on up to eight or nine. And at one time there were 12 parallel tracks at New Haven Station. And there would be different trains going different places on the tracks, as there are now. Uh, but at its peak, it was about a dozen separate tracks. And I think that nine of them were covered. And uh, so all of those would have been accessible through that tunnel system. This, by the way, was the standard way of doing tunnels, of doing track access, even at fairly small stations, like the little station in Putnam, if you've ever been there. Um, you still could go downstairs in the restaurant and where they have all the the uh, food stored and see the tiled underground um, passageway to the other side of the tracks. So that was a standard way of doing things. What function did the YMCA play in the railroad system? Okay, that's very good. Um, railroads inevitably required their crews to stop overnight. And there was concern that the engineers and firemen and, and crew would get off and seek out low life lodgings and unsuitable recreations, uh, et cetera. And as a result, the railroad YMCA movement started. This was a program whereby the railroads created YMCA facilities run by the YMCA, but paid for by the, or run in conjunction with the YMCA, but paid for by the railroad. New Haven is very fortunate in retaining its YMCA, railroad YMCA building. And that's up on the Northern part of State Street, almost to Hamden, where the Cedar Hill freight yards were. And when you think about it, Cedar Hill was where the crews changed and uh, all the maintenance occurred, et cetera out of sight of the station. The station was for the public. Cedar Hill was the sort of backstage of operations for the New Haven Railroad. And that's where the YMCA is. It's a very impressive building. It's like a four or five stories tall, built of brick, quite ornate and uh, still there. So um, Railroad YMCA was alive and well in New Haven. Did they ever make consider making the trains on the ground like the European ones uh, with an open air cover and separate indoor waiting rooms. I would say, uh, uh, I would say no. I think that the 1875 station grew fairly incrementally with uh, at first uh, just a couple of covered platforms and then additional covered platforms. And so the fact that it grew incrementally, I think prevented them from conceiving of the massive train shed over the tracks like you got in Europe in some parts of this country, actually. I think that the incremental growth was the, the explanation for that. But I'm kind, of, uh, I'm kind of winging it there. If you have another explanation, <laughs> we could hear it. Um, certainly they had the space to do it. Once they moved out to that area around Union Street and, and Church Street, they certainly had space to do something. And don't forget, the railroad went through great periods of prosperity and profitability, and then periods of debt and bankruptcy. Uh, they were close to bankruptcy before World War I. World War I kind of gave them a reprieve. They went bankrupt in the 30s. They recovered during World War II. 
And then things started to go downhill in the 50s. I take the chance to do a really good train shed type thing. Embracing all the tracks was, was, was really not in the cards. Other comments? Compliments, criticisms. You have, a, you have a question about the balance of freight and passenger traffic on the Hartford to New Haven line. Yeah, that's uh, that's rather interesting question. Uh, the answer is for probably the first six or seven years, it was primarily passengers and it was primarily passengers trying to get to the steamboats. Once it got through to Springfield, it connected up with the great east-west route that went from Boston to the Hudson River. So that really made freight uh, a lot more viable. I mean, let's face it, if all you're doing is going between um, Hartford and New Haven, where's the freight there, right? You, um, but then once you get that connection, you can move all kinds of products in, all kinds of products out. And I would say that the balance went to pretty much a 50-50. However, uh, that in and of itself is kind of unique. Uh, Connecticut was among the most densely populated parts of the country uh, and generated more um, passenger traffic than in a lot of parts of the country. Uh, and um, at some time, at some points in time, the passenger revenue on the New Haven exceeded freight revenue, which was rather rare. Uh, who were the passengers? Everyone. Uh, there were classes of, uh, you know, there was coach, there was parlor, there was private car. On the steamboats, you could uh, just sit out on the deck. Uh, and or you could get a good uh, second class cabin or first class cabin. Everything reflected the class structure of those uh, of the time, but basically everyone. And of course, during wartime, um, uh, a lot of troop movement as well. Oh, Charles Dunn, hi, how are you? Uh, the first railroad YMCA was the old New Haven and Derby station on Spring Street near the New Haven corporate offices on the Meadow Street. Thank you, I had forgotten that. Uh, in fact, the New Haven and Derby maintained a separate station even after they went in on the Chapel Street so that New Haven and Derby trains uh, would go through to Chapel Street, but they did maintain uh, separate facilities there. And then I, that became the uh, site of the first railroad YMCA building. Very interesting. I want to go back to passengers. Um, depending on the time period, um, there always were a lot of excursion travel. The railroad wanted to promote passenger travel and uh, actually would, or they had, right from the, well, I won't say from the very beginning, but from early days, the railroad had an excursion department that would work with groups that wanted to go to the shore for a shore dinner, et cetera. In the post-war period, this really reached a uh, They had a zoo train that went from Springfield to the Bronx Zoo and had live animals on board the train. They had a Broadway that went uh, all from all points uh, into New York, and then you would go to a Broadway show. They had showgirls on the train to kind of get you going. They had a rodeo train that went into Madison Square Garden, and uh, the singing cowboy, Gene Autry, uh, actually rode part of the train. Uh, as part of that rodeo promotion and part of that Madison Square Garden rodeo. So yeah, there was a, at least the railroad promoted a lot of pleasure travel. Uh, you may not know this, but there were ski trains that went uh, into Northern New England. And uh, one of these in the thirties had uh, between a thousand and 1500 passengers. So it was a pretty big deal. There was definitely a lot of recreational passenger travel. Though the most, of course, would have been business travel, followed by 
people going on vacation, relocating, visiting family, et cetera. So that's a long answer to a short question. Do you think we will get the high speed trains? Um, those of you who have ridden the Acela or wrote it in the various early days may remember that they had the, a display showing the speed of the train. And that was discontinued because it only reached impressive speeds at one point in Rhode Island. The fact of the matter is we have too many curves, too much, we, we have too much invested in the current rail route. In order to do true high-speed trains between Boston and New York, they'd have to come up with a completely new alignment. And Southern Connecticut is not the sort of place where you can acquire land cheaply and with little public opposition uh, and build a bullet train right away. So I think we will see improvements in rail. I think we'll see improvements in speed, but uh, I don't think that you're gonna see uh, I don't think you're going to see the bullet train too short too, too, in, in the near future. Um, I did not know that the New York and New Haven was not all rail in 1848. Bob Boletsky, whose Tyler City website is a marvelous resource. Yes, all the, um, all the really big rivers were uh, car ferries. And the impediment in uh, New Haven westward, the uh, impediment was uh, the Housatonic, which was bridged in the 1870s, early 1870s. Um, and it, going east, the impediment was first the Connecticut River, again, bridged in 1870, and then the Thames River, which was not bridged to the 1880s. So we think of the shoreline as the Connecticut Rail Route, right? But for many years, it was the inland route that was the real viable route. And the shoreline had all these places. Uh, Charles Dickens described taking a train along the shoreline and going on one of what were called the car ferries. The locomotive would be on one side, would back the passenger cars onto a car ferry. The ferry would go across the river. Another locomotive would connect up and carry the train on its journey. And uh, he has a very humorous description in American Notes about how uncomfortable and ludicrous this was from his point of view. Um, but car ferries, unfortunately, were part of that uh, early experience of rail travel. Bruce, could I just, uh, one final question, which we missed, uh, one question we missed from earlier, which is, are there links between Union Station in New Haven and Union Station in DC? Yes. Was there a, uh, I guess I, I would say, and I don't know the date of the DC Union Station. However, um, it's of the same period as the early 20th century Renaissance Revival, uh, City Beautiful, stations. It fortunately is still in the heart of things or was built in the heart of things in DC. And it too fell into decline, right? I mean, tremendous decline and was revived about the same time as Union Station New Haven in the 1980s when federal dollars became available to accomplish what private enterprise in the form of what the, the uh, shell of the railroads were, was able to accomplish. So in that sense, a sort of, uh, a sort of link. I don't know who designed uh, Union Station. I'd have to get on Google and look it up and I would screw everything up if I did that. Bruce, um, the final comment has just come in which says very interesting talk, thank you. And I think that says what we all want to say at this point. It really has been absolutely fascinating. You suggested this talk and you've shown to us that there is a tremendous audience for it, but also so. tremendous interest, but also that you know so tremendously so much about it. And we are so grateful to you for sharing both your knowledge, your ability to communicate it, but also your enthusiasm and your wit, which really have made, made this a wonderful hour. Thank you very much indeed on behalf of everybody here. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. I enjoyed talking to you and uh, I hope I didn't make two mistakes. Charlie John just pointed out that uh, 
that they did have a bridge over the Housatonic, a wooden bridge in 1848. So I was wrong about that end, but I'm definitely right about the Eastern end requiring car ferries. But thanks, uh, thanks for correcting me on that. Now everyone has your correction. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bruce, indeed. It's, it's been wonderful. We hope we'll have you back again soon. It couldn't have been better. Thank you.